Are you looking to up your reading game? If you already read well, but you'd like to start exploring more in-depth material, dare we say more difficult material, then stay tuned for this video. It might help you step it up a notch. Hi there, I'm Library Lynn, and I make knowing great nonfiction books my mission. Don't know what to read next? I always have ideas. Today, we're going to look at the third part of the book, How to Read a Book, The Classic Guide to Intelligent Reading by Mortimer J. Adler and Charles Van Doren. We've been making our way through the book and we've already covered the introduction and the first chapter on a reading mindset here. And we've been introduced to the four levels of reading and the first level, the elementary level here. Today, we're only going to examine one chapter but it's a big one. We're going to look at chapter four, the second level of reading, inspectional reading. Here's a chart that sums up the four levels of reading. According to Adler and Van Doren, everyone must start at the bottom and understand and master each level before they can effectively move to the one above it. And in this chart, we look at the stages of elementary reading that every person must be able to do before they can move on to the second level, inspectional reading which is what we're covering today. Adler and Van Doren contend that the elementary level of reading is not true reading. This was a surprise to me. By the time you're fluent, you can read passages aloud and comprehend them on a basic level. But most people they find have bad reading habits that they learned while they were learning to read and that hinders their further progress. We're gonna discuss some of these bad habits as we go along. It wouldn't surprise me if many of the people who, who say they don't like to read don't like to read simply because they have some of these bad reading habits. Their understanding and their enjoyment would escalate if they became aware of these habits and worked to correct them. Today, we'll grasp what the authors consider to be true reading. First off, what is inspectional reading? Well, in a nutshell, it's going over a work, and they're referring to books only, but this would also apply if you need to read over a contract or, or anything, uh, an article, anything that you need to read quickly. These authors are very fond of making lists and dividing things into levels. While inspectional reading itself is one skill, they recommend that to learn it, you break it into two parts. And they say that eventually you can do these two parts simultaneously, but I've been scratching my head over that one. I don't see how you could do them both simultaneously, but here we go. The first level is called systematic skimming or pre-reading. Let's say you have a book that you're either thinking about reading or are determined to read. I'm not talking about the latest best-selling novel. I'm talking about a serious work of nonfiction or a classic, which could be a novel like Middle March by George Eliot. But for my example, I'm gonna use nonfiction. It would be something that's a stretch for you it doesn't matter if it's a piece of cake for your best friend. It's anything that you would find difficult to read but would like to. The example they give is Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which I've never read. I'm going to use the book that I just finished, The Great Bridge by David McAuliffe. This book counts for me because I know zip about engineering, uh, materials, math, and very little about classical physics. Not to mention, I know nothing about bridge construction. So I'm gonna use this book as my example for inspectional reading, even though I've already determined to read it. There are six steps. Step number one, look at the book's title page and its preface if it has one. Do this quickly and ask yourself, what sorts of categories would you place the subject of the book in? Well, for my book, I can look at the title, the cover image, and the subtitle and tell that it's a book about building the Brooklyn Bridge. There is no preface, but McAuliffe does make a note at the beginning that a history of this bridge has never been thoroughly written before this book. So I place it in my mind in four categories, engineering, history, New York City, and books by David McAuliffe. The last one, books by David McAuliffe, I add because I already know he's a widely acclaimed author and I've read other books by him that I enjoyed. So that adds to my feeling that I should read this book. Step two, study the table of contents to get a sense of the book's structure. The book's structure is very important to understanding a book. You really must, they say, get a grasp on that. So they recommend reading the table of contents like you'd read a road map before taking a trip somewhere. You can see in this book's table of contents that there are three parts, 
with two picture sections. I would assume that it goes from planning to early building to middle building and completion. The chapter titles do give hints of this. Chapter one, for instance, is called The Plan. I assume that's about planning for the book. Part two in chapter eight, it says all according to plan. I assume that means that they've already started construction and everything's going fine. Part three, chapter 15 is at the halfway mark. So I know they're halfway done with the bridge. And then later on, still in part three, is chapter 23, and yet the bridge is beautiful which I would assume is about when the bridge is completed. That's near the end of the book. So I know from looking at the table of contents that this book is roughly structured in chronological order. And it also tells me that there's back matter if I'm interested. There's an epilogue, appendix, notes, picture credits, bibliography, and an index. If I'm just reading the book for my own amusement, I may or may not be interested in these latter elements. I will say that I always read epilogues because the book is not complete in my opinion, if you haven't read it. They contend that even if the chapter titles don't tell you very much about the book, it's good to go through it before you begin. Step three, the index. They say that if an index is available, you should always glance through it. If it's a nonfiction book, I consider an index essential in all but the shortest of books. Look for the topics covered. They say to look up a few of the terms that seem crucial or important and to find the reference in the book itself. It's possible the passage you look up will give insight into the most important points in the book. In this section on the Brooklyn Bridge, importance of, I would assume, is crucial to the book, so I'll look that up. And he begins by talking about how for 50 years after completion, this bridge was considered the eighth wonder of the world. So I know that not only does it still look impressive, but it must also have been a truly astounding undertaking. Even if I weren't already reading this book, I think this might would make me want to read it. I admit that I've never been one to read through indexes before beginning a book unless I was writing a paper. I did make it a habit to do that before committing to a more thorough examination of the book because I didn't want to waste my time on something that wouldn't answer my questions. Number four, if the book has a publisher's blurb, read it. The blurb is just a short summary from the publisher about what the book is about and why you would want to read it. I've always read one of these before reading anything else if they have one. They say that people often don't read them because they assume they are pure puffery. And that phrase made me smile, pure puffery. <laughs> yes, the publishers are trying to sell books, but the blurbs still provide valuable information about the book. And if the book doesn't say anything important, that tells you something too. They say it may be because the book doesn't say anything important either. So that's something to think about. Only after accomplishing the steps above, are you ready to start skimming? So go back to the table of contents, they say, and see if you can figure out the most important chapters. You should read the introduction and the summary of these chapters closely. I already picked out the most pivotal chapters for my book above. If nothing is labeled an introduction or a summary, you should read the first and last paragraph or two of each of these important chapters. And that should give you information about the book as a whole. But if it doesn't, at least you have a clue as to the author's writing style. Is it clear? Is it dense? Is it flowery? And that may impact your decision as to whether or not to read further. So then turn the pages. Read a paragraph or two, and sometimes a few pages throughout the book at random. See if you can find the main point of the book, or at least the main thread of thought. But the most important thing they say is to read the last few pages of the book or the epilogue if it has one. This will let you know what the author hopes to have proven by the end of the book. So that's it for step one. And I'm curious, do you already do any of these? Do you some of them? I mean, I always look at the table of contents. I always have, and I always read the first few paragraphs, usually at the beginning of the book, just to see if I like the writing style. If I don't like the writing style and I don't need to read the book, I usually will skip it. But I'm going to start following these steps just to see if it increases my comprehension or if it causes me to decide not to read more books at all. And they say all these steps, all six of those steps, should take no more than five minutes to an hour. So if you've only come this far, congratulations. You've been engaged in active reading, and we know they like active reading. Once you've accomplished the steps above, you should move on to stage two, which is superficial reading. They say superficial reading a book is necessary if the book is above your current level of understanding. You can't expect to read a book that's over your head and grasp it all in one reading. Superficial reading is a crucial part 
part of understanding any difficult book. And remember, what's simple for one person may be difficult for someone else who has an equal uh, intellectual ability. It's not about the intellect, it's about how well informed you are on the subject. So it's not a sign of inferiority if you need to really take your time with these steps. And this may come as a shock, but in this stage, they say you should read straight through the book without stopping to look anything up or to ponder over anything you don't understand. And they're very serious about that when they say to skim it. If you come to things you don't understand, just keep reading straight past them. They promise that at some point you will, you will find your footing, so to speak, and come across things you do understand. When you come to those points, enjoy that feeling and pay attention to what you're reading. Their contention is that if you stop to figure out what you don't understand, you're likely to become overwhelmed, give up, and never go back to that book. If you only understand half of what you read, then that half will help you when you go back and read the book again. Now, at this point, I would say that if you don't need to understand a book and you don't care whether you understand it or not totally, there may be no need to read it again. But if you really want or need to understand, I think it makes sense to bite the bullet and just commit yourself to this quick superficial reading before you read the book again more thoroughly. The problem here, they say, is that most of us were taught in school that as soon as you come to something you don't understand, you need to stop and look up a word or or try to figure it out before you move on. They say these instructions are appalling. To their minds, this is why most people don't enjoy Shakespeare. They say if students read the play straight through and then talk about what they got out of it without analyzing anything, they're better prepared to go back and look at scholarly notes and vocabulary explanations and get something out of them than they would have been if they had been forced to stop every time they didn't understand the first time through. They say the slow, careful approach ruins the experience for students and they wind up l learning little or nothing of value. Almost nothing of the play will stick with them. And that really is tragic because Shakespeare's great. And I readily admit, I skimmed over much of the material in this book about the Brooklyn Bridge, about materials that they used and air pressure and cable construction. I don't understand it. And if I had to stop and look all that up, I'd never finish the book at all. It occurs to me that one of the reasons I may read so much is because I'm super good at this second stage of inspectional reading. I get what I can from a book the first time I read read through and I often don't go back. And I don't usually need to because I'm reading for fun. My career and my life doesn't hinge on how well I understand the material. But they do say that reading of this type, which is what I do most of the time, does help you gain a better understanding of the big picture, which I'm pretty excited about. At least I know now that I am getting something out of the things I'm reading. They say to grasp the finer points, you need to first get that big picture. And that's where I expect my own habits will need to change and they're gonna be challenged. If you try to understand these fine details to start with though, they contend that you're not reading well. Okay, so all this talk about grasping a work under time constraints may have you wondering about speed reading, and they do address that here. Speed reading was all the rage around the time they wrote this book, which was in some, somewhere around the early 70s. Adler and Van Doren say speed reading courses are basically remedial reading. They say they teach people at the elementary level to read faster through establishing better reading habits. For instance, some people sound out words in their heads while they read, or they even form the words with their lips while they read, and that's a very bad habit. It slows you down. But they stress that speed reading is not always appropriate. Different reading requires reading at different speeds. Sometimes slow reading is appropriate, and at other times it's inappropriate. With practice, you can easily determine for yourself which is needed at what times. They say some books don't deserve to be read well. It would be a waste of time to read them slowly. And in that case, a quick skim is all you need. So the trick is to train yourself to read at different speeds and to have discernment about when to implement them. And of course, that does come with practice. To overcome bad habits, they suggest you use two fingers or a bookmark to guide your eye down the page. Don't allow yourself to go back. Keep it moving steadily down the page. And if nothing else, they say this will heighten your attention so that you're actively engaging in what you're reading. But with time, you can train yourself to move down the page a lot faster. But they say comprehension is the real issue. It's not possible to completely understand new material without reading it analytically which we will be covering later. But to read something analytically, you have to give it an inspectional reading first. 
their words, not mine. During inspectional reading, they say, race through even the hardest book. You will then be prepared to read it the second time. And you have to grasp the structure of the book to do an adequate superficial reading. Inspectional reading is also necessary when you get to the final le level of reading, syntopical reading. So that's level two, inspectional reading. The next video in this series is gonna cover chapter five, how to be a demanding reader. I'm looking forward to that one. Do you practice inspectional reading? If not, do you think you might give it a try? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. To find books worthy of higher reading, check out my books, Library Lens Curated Collection of Superlative Nonfiction and Library Lens Biographies, Autobiographies, and Memoirs for thousands of highly recommended titles on topics of all sorts. So until next time, happy reading.